Would you remain standing as we read this morning's scripture? Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. You pray with me this morning. Jesus, here it is, Sunday morning, the morning that you rose victorious from the grave declaring the good news all around the world through your church that you are alive. Lord, when we place our faith in you, the Bible says we are a new creation. God, this morning we come not to hear a new message, but a very old message, life, death, burial, resurrection of you, our Savior. But nonetheless, God, we could mine the depths of this truth for eternity 
and never exhaust the riches of the good news that you have for us. And so here it is, God, as we come to learn from your word, I pray that the worship from music would carry over into our study, that our hearts would be made glad. We would experience joy and you would receive glory as we're reminded of your love for us and what it means to put on the new self. Spirit of God, would you do a work in our hearts this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, you guys. Go ahead and grab a seat. If you're new to us this morning, uh, I especially want to say welcome. So glad you guys are here. You're at our Sunday morning gathering of City Light Church, and my name is Gavin. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, If you'd please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. Uh, If you're new to your Bibles, we've got some black pew Bibles around. Uh, That would be on page 978 there. And uh, uh, our text was read for us this morning. As you turn, let me kick us off this way. St. Augustine uh, was an early and very influential Christian thinker, theologian, and writer. But before he was a Christian, he was somewhat of a, of a ladies' man. In fact, uh, history goes, he was kind of a, like a sex addict. It was a big deal for this guy. And every city he went, he had his brothels, he had his mistresses. Well, in 387, Augustine met Jesus, was baptized, gave his life to the Lord, and uh, started his walk with God. The story goes that sometime after his conversion, he was back in one of his old stomping grounds where he ran into one of his old mistresses. And and seeing Augustine, she started to to flirt, to get her game on, right, and uh, to, 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 to try to get his attention. But Augustine um, didn't make eye contact. He just walked on by. Well, this gal was kind of offended, you know, like, Augustine, what's up? I'm not, I'm not good enough for you anymore. And, and, and the story goes, she cried out after him, Augustine, it is I. To which, without even turning around, he replied, I know, but it is not I. And he kept walking. This morning, I want you to know that at the heart of Christianity, It's not this idea that you become a nicer person, it's that you're a new creation. See, I think one of the most common misunderstandings is is that Christianity is really a worldview, a system of ethics, a, a bunch of kind of moral boundaries and guidelines that we live our life by, that Jesus just wants to make us into a nicer version of ourselves. Some of that might be true, but I want you to know the heart of Christianity is not about becoming a nicer person. It's about being made a new person. See, when you become a Christian, you put your faith in Jesus, it goes like this, right? I believe that I'm a sinner. I stand guilty and condemned apart from a holy God. But Jesus came to live and die in my place. He died for my sins. We become a Christian when we say, yes, Lord, I need your grace. I receive your forgiveness. And in a moment, we're a new creation. The Bible says that, that in that moment of professing faith in Jesus, that our death, our sin, our guilt is transferred off of us and onto Jesus. He dealt with that on the cross simultaneously. Jesus is righteous perfection and holiness before God is transferred to us. It's called imputed righteousness. And in that moment, we are a new creation. The Bible uses all kinds of different language to illustrate this and paint the picture. It says we're born again, right? That we're spiritually made anew, that we were dead and now we're born. And in that moment, you get what the Bible calls a new identity. You're not who you used to be. You might have the same address, You might look the same in the mirror. You might have the same driver's license and the same name, but the the chorus of core of who you are is different. You've gone from a child of wrath to a child of God, from guilty to forgiven, from condemned to set free, from lost to found, from sinner to saint. You are absolutely a new creation. And I just want to preach that into us as a church this morning. Listen, if you're a a Christian, you need to understand that. You are a new creation in Christ. God is not mad at you. God loves you. And listen, his affection and feelings towards you aren't based on your obedience and how you did this week, right? Your obedience, which is spotty at best, but on Christ's obedience, which is perfect, 
God's love towards you is not based on your faithfulness and church attendance, which ebbs and flows with Husker wins and losses, right? Props to you guys for being here after a disappointing one, right? Christ's affection towards us isn't based on, on our faithfulness, but on Christ's faithfulness towards us, which is unwavering, unfaltering, perfect. If you were in Christ, you were saved sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. God put his name on you and said, you're mine. No one can take you away. You are a new creation from day one. You are a new creation in Christ. Now listen, even though we are changed immediately, new identity, new person in Christ, our actions and attitudes and behaviors, our thought life, the way we live our lives, they don't change overnight, do they? In fact, the rest of our Christian life, Christian growth is really learning how to live out the new identity that we already are in Jesus. How to take off that old man, say, no, that's not me anymore. To put on the new man, which is made in the image of Christ. I use this illustration way too much, but it's so good, I'm going to continue to use it. I was married to my wife on May 13th, 2006. And on that day, when we said our vows, my identity changed immediately, right? The day before, I was Gavin the single dude. The next day, I was Gavin the married man. There was a point in time when I was a new man. My identity changed. Now, that first year of marriage, did I really know how to live as a married man? No. Bed's not made, toilet seat up, clothes on the floor, toothpaste. I don't know what I'm doing. How do I handle conflict in a marriage? I don't know, right? Now we've been married seven, seven and a half years, and I'm still not batting a thousand, but I have a few things figured out now, right? The way I think is more like a married man. The patterns of my life are more like the rhythms of a married man. Now, that doesn't make that first year of marriage. I was, I was no less a married man then than I am, am now, but I've learned how to live out of the new identity that I have. And listen, in Christ, when you place your faith in Jesus, you are absolutely a new creation in Christ. That's what our verse says this morning. But it says, for the rest of your life, you walk in a pattern of taking off your old thought patterns, taking off the way you used to live, and choosing to put on Christ. Say, no, this is what's true of me now. Christ lives in here. I'm going to listen to his voice. That old man, he died when Jesus came to live in here. And when we hear our old sins and the old man haunting us, just like Augustine, we can say, I know what's you. I know what you offer, but it's not me. The person that used to say yes to that is now dead. Christ lives in here. This morning, as we wade through our verses, we got 15 verses we're going to unpack this morning. I just want you to be asking a couple questions. Number one, I think it's important to ask, are you a new creation? Maybe you've always thought of Christianity as like, this religious system that's going to make you a better husband, wife, employer, more moral, better. Listen, Jesus doesn't want to make you better. He wants to make you new. Place your faith in Jesus and be a new creation. Second thing I want to ask you is if you place your faith in Christ, are you actively taking off your old patterns, actively taking off the old man and putting on the new man? God wants to speak that into us this morning, that we would trust him to live out the new identity as a new creation, and to take off the old. So so here's our outline. I just want to hit two points this morning. I'm a simple dude. I'm not a morning dude. So if I drink lots of coffee and stick it to two points, sometimes we get somewhere. So point one, the first eight verses or so, he's just talking about the old man. Who is that old self that we have to take off? What did he look like, and how do we take him off? Point two is put on. How do we put on Christ? How do we live out of what is truest of us? So point one, take off. Point two, put on. Easy enough? You with me? All right. Just FYI, if you're new, you can give some verbal feedback at this church. Let me know I'm doing all right, okay? Give me a little, let me know if you're with me. Point one, here we go, take off. Paul spends the, the first few verses describing this old man, okay? Verses 17 through 22, he says, this is who you used to be. And then a key verse comes in 22 when he says, now take off your old way of living. That word put off is actually what it says. To put off the old self, the verb that's translated put off is the same verb that that the writer would use to take off an article of clothing. He's saying this is how you used to be, but just like the shirt that you wore yesterday that started to stink by 10 p.m., you took it off, right? 
He says, listen, the same way your old man is starting to smell like B.O., take it off. Just like you would take off a shirt. That old pattern of thinking, take it off. Those old things you thought were going to bring you life and joy, take them off. Take it off. It's an act of obedience. Uh, let's go through, I just kind of want to walk through what are the characteristics of the old man that we're supposed to take off. Uh, look with me at verse 17. He says, don't walk like the Gentiles do. In other words, you used to walk like that, take it off. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's kind of an interesting statement that he makes. Here's why. The Ephesian Christians that he's writing to are Gentiles. So how are they not supposed to be who they are? This is referring to their ethnic background, their cultural background, the color of the skin, the people who they grew up with. How can they not be who they are? What Paul is saying is, listen, your primary point of identification is not the neighborhood you grew up in. It's not the color of your skin. It's not your family background. It's not the culture that you grew up in. It's not the country that you live in. Your primary point of identification is who you are in Christ. If he was writing this to us, he would say, no longer walk like the rest of Omaha. Right? You used to just go with the flow. Whatever the culture valued, you valued. Whatever was going on around you, you just kind of hopped in. He says, take that off. In Christ, you have you have a new way of thinking, a new pattern of life, new desires. Don't walk like the rest of Omaha anymore. Don't just go with the flow of the people around you. Take that off. right? Surrender your life to Christ. Take it off. Then in verse 17, he, he lands us a really big compliment. He's saying, uh, this is describing all of us, by the way. One second before we trusted Christ, one year before we trusted Christ. This is true of us. He said, don't walk like the Gentiles who are in the futility of their minds. He's saying, you're thinking, it's futile. Now let me ask you, I want a response. Is that a compliment? No, right? Futile means worthless, of no value, not helpful, not doing anything for you. He's saying, before you met Jesus, it wasn't just that you struggled with some sins. It was that your whole mental infrastructure was jacked up. You weren't thinking right. You couldn't even think straight, right? You thought you were living on the 70 to 90 year playing field when really you've been on an on-ramp to eternity the whole time. You're lost in a state and you're looking at a map thinking it's going to help you. It's the wrong map. You can't even think right. Is anyone a Tommy Boy fan here? Big Tom, Callahan, Tommy Boy, yeah? Best movie ever if you haven't watched it. It's a very spiritual. It'll edify <laughs> Your walk with the Lord. A lot of my discipleship happened through that movie. But there's a scene in the movie where, where Tommy and Richard, the two main characters, are, are, are traveling salesmen for a season. And they're driving all over the country trying to sell brake pads to different auto parts store. And so the kind of the comedy of the movie are these two unlikely pairs stuck in a car kind of road tripping across the country. And there's one part of the movie where they're trying to get to a city called Davenport. Well, they don't know where Davenport is, but they've got a road map, and, and Tommy, Chris Farley's in the passenger seat trying to find where the city is, and, and uh, Richard's getting frustrated because they're lost, and he's convinced they're on a certain highway, but now he's starting to wonder, are we even on the right highway, and we've been driving this way for a long time, and then I think they hit a deer and have a moment and load the deer in the car, you remember that part? And so they're lost for a really long time trying to find their way on this map, and finally Richard pulls up to a gas station. And goes then he's going to ask for directions. And the funny part of the movie is when uh, Tommy Boy backs the car up to get gas, and the church or the door gets hyperextended, and then he spends the rest of the scene ramming the door back, and then it falls off. Holy shnikes! Remember that part, <laughs> Richard? What what'd you do? That part. But 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 the the point I want to part the part I want to point out is when Richard's talking to the gas station attendant. The conversation he has. He walks in and says. Hey, Chieftain, can you, uh, can you tell me where Davenport is? And the guy doesn't even look up from his book. He says, 22 mile. So Richard says, well, okay, I can't find it on this map. The guy goes, well, get yourself a new map. Richard, annoyed, says, well, um, it's got to be on the map because you say it's 22 mile away, and you're really smart. He says, I'm picking up your sarcasm. He says, I, I should hope so because I'm laying it on pretty thick, right? The guy finally sets his book down and says, this is a map of Illinois, which we're in, on the border of Iowa, which is where Davenport is. 
you're in the wrong state. Get yourself a new map, right? <laughs> the point is they were driving around for hours thinking they could figure it out if they just thought hard enough, right, that they would get to where they're going. What Paul is saying is, listen, it doesn't matter how smart you are, how educated you are, how many initials come after your name and your email signature or on your business card. Until you get your mind rewired by Jesus, your thinking is futile, right? You can be convinced that happiness is found in driving down this road. And you can be convinced of it only to find that the end of that road is called Jacked Upville, where your life is a train wreck, right? You can be convinced with your thinking of mind that, that man, freedom is ultimately found in doing whatever I want, whenever I want it, however I want to do it, right? And we journey down that road in the futility of our mind, and what we find at the end is not freedom, but addiction. Slavery to, you name it, work at the expense of a marriage, pornography, alcohol, substances, religion, and being a good person, right? We think we're so clever. Paul says, hey, this, I hate to break it to you. Your mind doesn't work <laughs> apart from Christ, right? This is not the feel-good portion of the sermon. Don't worry, we're going to get there in a minute. He says, take off that part. Your mind isn't futile anymore. You know where happiness is found. You know where joy and fulfillment is found. Don't follow. Take off your futile understanding. Next verse, he says, they are darkened in their understanding. Verse 18. In other words, not only, apart from Christ, not only do you have the wrong map, you're driving down the highway at 100 miles an hour with your lights off. You're in the dark mentally. You don't know which direction is a good way to go. You ever been in like an interior room of a building with no windows or doors or lights on? Now we all have cell phones, so we're not in the dark for long, right? We just pull out our phone and, and kind of shine it. Hey, thanks for the tweet, Chris. Um, but there was a day without cell phones where, where you could find yourself in the middle of a dark room, in the middle of nowhere. And it's an eerie feeling, isn't it, when you're like, trying to find the ground, and okay, there's the next step, and you don't know if you're about to fall off a cliff, hit a wall, or get to where you're going. It's really easy to get disoriented in the dark, right? You commit to one direction, you think, but you don't even know where you're going. Paul is saying, apart from the grace of God, your old self, he or she didn't even know where they were going, right? So many people invest their whole lives in some goal that they think is going to get them to the destination that they want to, only to find out it's completely worthless, right? Invest their whole life to, to achieve some, some promotion, some job title, some status, some wardrobe, some accolade or achievement, some religious status, only to find out that on that last day when Jesus comes back, it doesn't count. No one cares. It's going up in flames. He's saying, your old self lived in the dark. You didn't know if left or right was a good way to go. Don't live that way anymore. Listen, Jesus is the light of the world. And you have Jesus in your heart now. Let him show you where joy and fulfillment and satisfaction is found. Take off that old way of thinking that left you in the dark. He says, take off your old way of thinking. Next verse, he says, uh, where are we at? Verse 19, he says that when our, when our understanding is darkened, that our hearts become callous, that we become greedy to practice every kind of impurity, and that we give ourselves over to sensuality. That sounds like a drunken frat party, doesn't it? Right? He starts off, you're, you become callous. Well, what is a callous? I have some calluses on my body. A callous is when, is when you have a repetitious motion that's going on in your body, and it hurts at first. You feel the pain and consequences, but if you keep doing it, your body builds up some dead skin cells and creates a hard surface, and so you don't even feel its consequences anymore. Paul's saying, listen, your old self, it was calloused towards sin and the voice of God and the conviction of God. You were so committed to your sin that you couldn't even see how it was wrecking your life and, and dishonoring God before. You didn't care. Your heart was hardened. It was calloused. He says, when your heart is callous, you're living in ignorance of God and you give yourself, you become greedy for every kind of impurity, right? Not like we stumble into sin sometimes, it's like we crave it. What's the next disobedience that I can do that I think is going to bring me joy? And then he says that we give ourselves over to sensuality. Uh-oh, 
What does sensuality mean? It means exactly what it sounds like. Sexual sin, right? Sex before marriage, any sort or kind. Sex outside of marriage, pornography, adultery, fantasies, any kind of weird thing you can do with your clothes off. Sensuality, right? Uh, Verse 22 says that it's our deceitful desires. It's saying without a transformed mind, your, your old way of thinking promised you things that it didn't deliver. You were deceived by your desires. Take it off. Don't listen to that anymore. How many times have your desires promised you one thing and left you another? Well, if I sleep with my boyfriend, then he's going to love me and respect me, and then I'm going to feel good about myself, right? Listen, that's deception. Don't let his deceptive desires corrupt your heart. It's going to cause him to love and respect you less, and it's going to devastate you. He says, take off your, your deceptive desires, I look at porn, I'm sure to be happy, right? It'll satisfy me. That's a deception. That's a lie. It's going to leave your tank emptier than it did before. He says, don't let your heart become callous to where you're not even convicted of sin anymore. Guard your heart. Take off that old man. Those deceptive desires, you know they're lying to you. Make a decision. Mm, That's not me anymore. I don't listen to my deceptive desires. Here's one I hear all the time. I just haven't been happy in a long time. Like basically since we said I do, my life has sucked, right? I need to do me for a while. I need to get happy, and I'm going to be happy as soon as I'm outside of this marriage. It's a deceptive desire. You know how many couples, even in my short tenure in ministry, I've counseled and met with that were convinced that they were going to be happy as soon as they went through the divorce, but their life went from like crummy to horrible, right? Listen, it's a deception. Don't be duped. Paul is saying... Your old way of thinking, listen to the lies. You were gullible. You were dark in your understanding. You gave yourself over to these deceptive desires, but you have a new mind. You are a new creation in Christ. Don't listen to those deceptive lives anymore, but take them off. You are a new creation. Let Jesus renew and change the way you see the world through the good news of the gospel. Take off that old man. A very important verse, a key verse is in 23. He says, take off the old self, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He says, don't just take off the old, say no to the new. He says, you need some some rewiring up here. And I want you to notice, and actually answer my question, is that a passive command or an active command? In other words, is he saying, renew your mind or be renewed? That was a hard question to answer. Be renewed. I'll help myself out, right? It's passive. He's not saying, change the way you think. Don't don't think like that anymore. He's saying, be renewed passively in the spirit of your mind. Someone else is doing the renewal of your mind. It's Jesus. The idea is this. when, When Christ comes into your life, he doesn't just save you from hell. Yes, he does that. But the spirit of God comes inside of you. And as you meditate on the good news of what he's done for you, it starts to rewire the way you think. Having the conviction of the Holy Spirit in you as you listen to it, and don't tune it out and callous your heart, it will change the things you want to do. Jesus rewires your circuitry. He rewires your heart so that as you walk with and love Jesus, you start to love the things that Jesus loves. You start to hate and despise the things that Jesus hates. He starts to renew your mind. And listen, if you are a child of God, if you've trusted in Christ, you are a new creation. There's another passage in the New Testament that says that the mind of Christ is in you. He's already put his thoughts and desires. Now he's calling us in this passage to choose to live out of them, right? Choose to live out of the new self. Put on Christ. Don't just take take the old off, put on the new. He's saying take off the old, put on the new. Take off the old, put on the new. Every day when you wake up, take off the old, put on the new. When you face temptation, take off the old, choose, I'm going to put on the new. When you have a decision to make, say to yourself, take off the old. Jesus, make the decision in and through me. Those patterns in your life, is this a good idea? Take off the old, put on the new. 
Diana Nyad is a 64-year-old ultra-distance swimmer, 64 years old. She made the news this summer. Maybe you read the article or heard it in the news. She was the first person, male or female, of any age to swim from Cuba all the way to Florida without a protective cage. The 64-year-old woman swam for 110 hours without stopping, or 110 miles. It took her 53 hours to swim 110 miles. There was a CNN article that I read, um, and, and they asked her, like, how did you do it? And, and she pointed to a number of different things, but she said, you know, there were times in the journey when mentally I'm hallucinating, physically I'm vomiting from ingesting so much salt water that I'm shivering from the cold and, and I'm not in a right state. She said, in those moments, all I could focus on, she said, I'd tell myself, put your left hand in the water, I said, push Cuba back. Put your right hand in the water, pull Florida towards you. Push Cuba, pull forward. Push Cuba, pull Florida. Push Cuba, pull Florida. And she got there. I think that's a good illustration for the Christian life. There's going to be times when we don't know what to do. There's going to be times when temptations are heavy, when decisions are hard, when life is messy, we're disoriented, and don't know what to do. In that moment, you get out of bed, you say, Jesus, get rid of my old man, give me new desires. We say, take off the old, put on the new. Take off the old man, put on the new. Take off the old, put on the new. I think we should write that above our bed so we see it in the mornings. I'm a new creation in Christ, and today... I'm going to choose to take off that old man, darkened in his understanding, given in to sensual desires. I'm going to choose to, to think the thoughts of Christ after him. Where Paul goes next in our passage, he gets real practical. He gets out of theory. He says, I'm going to give you some examples. Verses 25 through 32, he's just going to run through very practically, what does the transformed mind look like? How do we take off the old and put on the new? What does that look like? Let me just hop through the verses. Keep your Bibles open with me. Verse 25 says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. That means the old self bends the truth. The old self likes to minimize my weaknesses and kind of exaggerate my strengths. Why? Because the old man was all wrapped up in what you thought about me and my family and my reputation and my career and who I am. And so I had to fabricate this facade called falsehood. That was the old man. Paul says, take him off, put on the new man. What does the new man do? He speaks the truth. Why? Because, listen, in Christ, I'm a new creation. My sins are forgiven. My value, dignity, and worth don't rest in what you think about me. What you think about me, my career, my family, my achievements, my accomplishments, it rests on what Christ thinks of me. And he loves me. And I'm secure and stable in Jesus, and I can speak the truth. Speak it to love and other people. Speak the truth about ourselves. Wear our sins and our faults on our shirt sleeves. Apply grace. Take off the old. Put on the new. Verse 26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So the old self held on to anger and resentment. The old self replayed what other people did to me and I held it against them. The old self let the devil beat me down and destroy relationships with unforgiveness and anger and bitterness and resentment because I thought it all counted and I had to keep score and hang on to it. The new self says, man, don't harbor anger? You know, God didn't harbor anger towards me when I sinned against a holy God. In fact, God sent his son Jesus to take on God's anger and wrath towards my sin, so that rather than anger and wrath, I could be at peace with a holy God. And when we're on the receiving end of from wrath to forgiveness, how can we not but give that to each other? See, the new self is quick to move from anger to peace. Next verse, verse 28 says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So the old self was a taker. The old self stole. The old self wanted to know, how do I get myself in a more advantageous position? The old self found his security and how much money was in his bank account, how many resources he had accumulated, and he would cut corners, cheat, and steal. 
he would cheat on his taxes, get out of a bill that he owed, do anything he could to put more chips in my stack because it was my security. But the new man, well, the new man, my treasure is in heaven. And I've experienced such a generosity that, that Jesus didn't just give me all he had, he gave me himself. He gave me his life on a cross, his spirit inside of me. I've received so much generosity that the new man is a giver. And put off the taker, put on the giver. Experience the generosity of Jesus and, and be a giver, a life giver, a resource giver, an encourager. Someone, I'm going to buy lunch. I'm going to help that family. I'm not just going to wonder who's going to do something. I'm going to give my time, talent, and life away. Because I know even if I hit the bottom of my grave without a penny, I'll still be the richest man in all of the universe for all of eternity because my treasure is in heaven. Take off the old self, which was a taker, put on the new self, which is a giver. Then he throws in an interesting verse, verse 30. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The idea here is that when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart. We studied this a few weeks ago. He seals us with the stamp of God, says this child is mine. And that Holy Spirit inside of you is, an emotion, is emotionally invested in your life. The Holy Spirit is not an it, it's a he, it's a person. It's the person of God living inside of you. And listen, if you sin one time or 500 times, God's opinion of you isn't going to change you're no less forgiven or a child of God, but you will grieve his heart. Like a, like a loving parent towards his children. My kids can't do enough wrong to, to, to make me not love them, but they can really break my heart when I watch a child that I love make devastating and destructive decisions with his or her life. It breaks my heart. Paul's saying the old man didn't give a rip, right? The old man, it was all about him. No relationship with God. I don't care what God thinks or says, or does, or feel, the new man is in relationship with God. I'm sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I choose to to put on the new self, because I don't want to grieve the God who bled and died because he loved me. We put off the old self, put on the new self. Lastly, verses 31 and 32, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Okay, what do we put on? It says, then be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. The old self felt like he was in competition with everybody. He was threatened by other people. He felt like he had to cut down other people and build himself up and keep records of their fault. The old self was bitter when other people got ahead. Paul says, take off the old man, the new man. The new, the new self knows I am in a way better position than I ever deserved to be. That Jesus forgave me, that Jesus has been unnecessarily kind toward me. Jesus has been very tender towards me when he should have been very harsh towards me. And so the new self is quick to forgive. The new self doesn't hold grudges. The new self isn't combative and, 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 and in competition and bitter with wrath and anger and clamor. Right? We take off the old self, we put on the new self. I want you to see these verses. These are not a list of do's and don'ts. Paul is describing what a transformed mind looks like. He's not saying, now do more, try harder. He's saying, listen, you are a new creation. Believe it. Choose every day to live out of the new identity you have in Christ. Walk around with your head up knowing that you're forgiven and loved by Jesus and available to pay that forward to the rest of the world. City Light, imagine what it would actually look like if this was more than a sermon. If you came this morning and received a living word from God and you woke up tomorrow morning and you said, I'm going to take off the old man, I'm going to put on the new. Yesterday I stumbled some, but guess what? Today's a new day and today I'm going to take off the old man and his desires and I'm going to put on the new. If we prayed every day, Jesus, I believe I am a child, perfect and righteous in your sight. God, help me to live like it. Give me your desires. You know, do you think... St. Augustine was tempted when he ran into that old gal on his old old stomping grounds and she put her flirt on? I think he was. I think through his mind is, you know what? That was pretty fun. You're pretty cute. I've been there before. We could, and he said, no. No. Those desires died when Jesus came to life in here. And in that moment, he made a decision. I'm going to live out of my new desire. 
my old desire was for self. My new desire is to honor God, and that's going to outweigh it. So he said, nah, I know it's you, but it is not I. City Light, I want us to be a church that's growing to look more like Jesus. I want you to know we have all the resources we need to do it. I want to encourage us as we leave here this morning to put off the old self and to put on the new self. Spirit of God, may you enable us to do that. May it be more than a good idea, but may it be who we are, your people. The way we're going to respond to the word of God this morning is very practically by the taking of communion. And communion is a very practical, tangible, physical reminder of the new creation that we have in Christ. See, when we take communion, we we remember that Jesus gave up his life so that we could receive new life. The bread represents Jesus' body, which was broken on the cross as a payment for our sins so that we could be forgiven. The juice represents the blood of Jesus that he spilled out of his body in the process. And we come forward to receive communion, the bread and the juice, to remember the price that was paid for the forgiveness of our sins and the new life we have in Christ. And this morning, two invitations for you. One, maybe this idea of a new creation is new to you. Maybe you came to church this morning thinking, I need to be a better person. My parents always said I should be in church. Things are tough in my marriage. Maybe I'm going to better myself by sitting in a church pew and getting some moral instruction. This morning, listen to this. God doesn't want to make you better. He wants to make you new. Would you become a Christian this morning? Would you say, I am guilty before a holy God. Jesus, I believe you lived, died, were buried, and rose again on my behalf. And that you rose to give me eternal life. I receive you into my heart this morning. And maybe your first act of worship would be to come forward for communion. Communion is for Christians to come forward and remember. Maybe you would come forward for the first time this morning. If you're already a Christian, you're a new creation in Christ, I just want to invite you as you get up out of that pew to come forward, that you would just say to yourself, put off the old man. That you would leave him in your seat this morning. Maybe there's besetting sins and patterns and struggles and thought life and way you live your life that belong to that old self. That belong to that former man. And you would just... Say, God, would you help me to leave that man in the pew this morning to take off the old self? And as you come forward to receive the elements, as you return to your seat, say, Jesus, would you put on the new? Would you help me to live out of the new desires that you've given me in my heart? Take off the old, put on the new. Let's pray, and then we'll come forward. Jesus, this morning we celebrate the good news of the gospel once again. We are unbelievably blessed by the generosity of the life and death of Jesus on our behalf. Your spirit lives inside of us. You have made us new. But God, there are times we still live like orphans. When we listen to those old voices, when we put on that old man, spirit of God, would you convict our hearts? Would you stir in our lives that we would put off the old self and put on the new? Jesus, would you transform our minds to think like you? As we come forward, God, would you encourage each one of us with the good news of the gospel as we receive communion? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're new to us, uh, the communion servers, go ahead and grab the elements. Come forward if you're serving this morning. Uh, They're going to be here, here, and over in the North Sanctuary. Uh, There's no ushers. We just start in the front rows, and if you would exit on the outside of the rows, you're going to come forward. The server will rip your bread for you. They've washed their hands. It's a good sanitary way to do it. Grab the bread, dip it in the juice, and uh, partake or eat of it that way, and then return down the middle aisle. If you're over there, leave out the right and come back to the left.
Would you guys stand with me real quick? Um, so, um, yeah. This next song. Grace 
Jesus, we thank you, Father, that you have not only created us as new creations, given us new identities, but God, every day your spirit is in us to empower us to live out in new ways. Oh, God, as a church, would you help us, Lord? Uh, take off the old man that's in us, that wants to still kill and destroy, that wants to lead us down to a death, depression, darkness, uh, and separation from you. But, oh, God, would you empower us this week, in this moment, from here on forward, to God, just to choose you every day. That God say, we want to be made new. We are going to live out our identity as a new creation in Christ Jesus. Oh, God, would you do that work? Would your spirit speak right here, right now? And may we not move forward with our day until we've heard your voice and that our callous hearts would be softened by your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Oh, that's fun. Gabe, you are awesome, by the way, man. Love it. Well, my name's Chris. Um, I wanted to pull, if you guys could pull out your programs, bulletins, I wanted to walk you guys through a few things real briefly. The first thing is, is some of you guys were here in the old days when we had like scaffolding and like if you sat in this section, you were literally at danger because there was plaster falling during the service. It was fantastic. It was just like if you were chosen to die that day, we could just do right, boom, gone, you know? Don't worry, we've had it fixed. Um, but but, man, you guys remember the pink toilet that we, we, like, stole from World War II? Like, we got it, like, an army surplus store from, like, the 40s. We had the pink toilet. I mean, it was nuts here. But I just want to let you guys know how far we've come. We have internet in the building. We have plumbing. The roof has been taken care of. And we've got, can we get the slide? Boom! A church app. Okay? Yes, give it up. Put your hands together. You better clap. Boom. This is insane, man. It's crazy. City Light Church on your phone gets me really, really excited. Now, we're not just trying to be the cool new hip church, but it's actually very practical. One, you can listen to sermons online uh, through your church app. You guys can download stuff, give online, watch videos, get connected to a city group, tons of different things you can do with it. But one of the most practical things is that if you uh, are green friendly, want to recycle, save the church money, any of those things, every week we print out tons of these, and then we've got to pick them up and throw them away. So uh, you can actually download the program right on your church app. Once you get it out, you just hit the program button, the bulletin, and uh, it'll have the scriptures and notes. You can take notes on there and save it there. It's really, really, really practical, uh, and also it keeps us from having to pick up these and print these and waste money and cut down trees. So be green friendly, okay? Care about the trees. Download the app. Get the bulletin on your phone. You can actually do that right now if you want. This is the only time in church you can pull your phone out. Two things you can do. Take a picture of me doing this. Say something really amazing about me and put it on Facebook. And then two, download the app, okay? 
Just uh, the only thing you have to do to search is for uh, search City Light, one word, church app, and then uh, go ahead and hit download and you'll get it on your phone. Awesome. Really excited about that. First hour, 9 o'clock, was just kind of like, church app, what's that? Smartphones? I don't know. What does that mean? So I'm really excited that you guys kind of made a little bit of noise for this, okay? Because I'm like super, super pumped. And I don't know if you're getting that right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Can we, you guys give it up for Gabe for that? Gabe is the one that put in all the hours on this thing. Give it up for Gabe. We are still working with, like, what to do with facial hair with him. We're doing some discipleship. But <laughs> bro's a beast with church apps. Beast. All right? Well, one of the things is every week we're aware that we have new people here, uh, and one of the things we want to do is make sure to get you guys connected, be in relationship with you, figure out how we can pray with you, for you and uh, answer any questions. So uh, would you pick up a connection card? Uh, they're either located in the back of the pews or out in the foyer area. Just drop these in the giving box on your way out. We'll be sure to follow up and connect with you, get you on our email list uh, so you guys can hear about news right when it happens. Also, uh, city groups are happening. Really fun stuff's happening in groups. We have like 14, 15 groups launched all over the city uh, that are reaching different neighborhoods, different networks. If you guys are new to City Light, our, our city groups are uh, really part of our DNA and our vision. We want a, uh, uh, discipleship to happen on Sunday mornings, but we have a shared and equal emphasis on the scattered church. What happens Monday through Saturday in your homes as we live as a community that's on mission in our city. We want to be more about than just hanging out on Sunday morning for an hour together. We want to be a family that does life together and invites some people into that family. And uh, so, so we have some photos. Gavin City Group through a really sweet Halloween block party. Boom! Give it up for Gavin and Sarah looking like beasts on that. You better put your hands together, okay? Got a couple more from his group. I don't know who these people are, but they look very interesting. Yes, Jason Eccleson and Amber, boom, army man and some kind of disco girl. Okay, one of the cool things about this is uh, their city group through this party, and they invited everybody to come, neighborhood friends, old high school friends, and they invited, and said, hey, just for your admission price, bring a whole bunch of candy. Uh, we're actually going to donate that candy to the North Omaha Hope Center and bless them because they're doing an event in North Omaha. So it's a win-win. Can you give it up to their city group one more time? Really excited for them. If you're not in a group, get in a group. Uh, if you have questions about that, please email me, contact me. I'd love to talk through which group might be best for you. Also, baby dedications are happening uh, December 15th. If you have a child uh, or a baby that you'd like to dedicate uh, to the Lord and to our church, uh, not to our church, it's okay if you leave our church, but more of the dedication to the Lord is important. Um, but we're not getting weird. It's not a lifelong. Anyway, so uh, it's a two-way commitment, baby dedications are. It's a commitment saying, one, hey, listen, we are going to try to raise this kid to love Jesus. We're going to do whatever it takes to, to parent, disciple. Uh, we're going to walk with other families that walk with Jesus so they can see what that looks like. We're going to do everything we can to parent uh, well and say, hey, listen, God, would you work in this child's life? And it's a two-way commitment from the church to say, listen, we're going to come alongside you, resource you, equip you, pray with you, and do everything we can uh, to help you raise this child to love Jesus Christ. So if you'd like to do baby dedication, uh, December 15th the date. Also, email Sarah. She's on this uh, bulletin. You can email her and say, hey, listen, we're in, and there's a class on the 8th right here at City Light. We'll give, do free lunch and uh, just talk to the parents about what this commitment really looks like biblically and give some resources for that. Uh, also, Sunday morning serving teams. Did you guys know Sunday morning takes like 100 people to do this thing? Everything from AV team, video team, setup team, greeting, hospitality, security, kids stuff downstairs. Tons of people help. And so um, we are kind of doing the numbers. And one of the things we want you guys to understand that this is not – City Light's not just like a buffet that you come and you eat at. It's, it's a potluck. It's a family meal where everybody brings something, and we want you guys to have a sense of shared ownership. This isn't Gavin and I's thing because we're the paid professionals. This is the people of God's thing. And so uh, about four uh, people out of ten right now are serving or have some kind of ownership in the church, whether that be leading a city group or serving on Sunday morning. We can do better, all right? Six out of ten of you guys are just chilling, all right? Serve. Do something. Or go somewhere else. Okay, I'm joking. Okay, I'm joking. But we really do. We really do want you guys, as part of your discipleship, as part of your spiritual growth, to say, I'm in and I'm going to do something. Right? I'm going to serve. So if you guys want to do that, again, email Sarah. Her email's on here. She's our administrative pro. Fantastic. She'll get you guys connected to the right team. Uh, one, couple, two last things. One is we got a Bible for you. 
Spelled this way, upside down. Boom. Bible, if you don't have a Bible, would you take one on your way out? This is our gift to you. We want to bless you guys with this. If you have a friend that needs one, please feel free to take one of these, write a little note into it, and give it to them. Also, the Yates Community Center that does ministry to refugees in this area, uh, we have a connection with them, partnership with them. And uh, they've kind of let us know that uh, there's tons of refugees in this area that moved to uh, Nebraska in flip-flops and T-shirts. That can be a problem in November and December. And so they've asked us to um, go ahead and start collecting uh, winter clothing, coats, hats, uh, hoodies, all those things, gloves. Uh, we have a box out in the foyer. We would love if we just rocked this thing out for them and collected a couple hundred coats. Would you please uh, get your old stuff, clean it out, and drop it in there or go buy something new, new for them, uh, especially kids. Uh, elementary ages would be great. We would really, really love to bless that community center and partner with them. Last thing, you guys know City Light Church, we never pass a plate. We don't want you to give out a compulsion. Uh, but we do believe that as the people of, of God experience his generosity, they're going to respond generously. Gavin talked about that today. The old man tries to find his security and what he has, how many zeros, everything that he's accomplishing, achieving, and everything he's putting aside. The new man says, listen, I want to be a steward by God's grace for everything I have, my time, talent, and resources to build the kingdom of God. I realize that I'm not my provider, but God is my provider. Put on that new man, and one of the ways you can tangibly respond is by giving generously. You can give in two ways to City Light Church. Put your tithes and offering in the box, in the giving box right back here. Otherwise, you can give online at citylightomaha.org. Let's pray and get out of here. Jesus, love you so much. Thank you, Jesus, for the way that you've even called us to be a new man. As Gavin's first point was that you didn't come to make us nicer, but you came to make us new, that you're, we're not loved and accepted because of our faithfulness, but in spite of our unfaithfulness, based or all around your faithfulness to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. God, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. I pray as a church, oh, Lord, would your spirit empower us to this week choose you. God, would you convict us of where our hearts have grown cold to you and been callous to you, and maybe we've been putting on the old man for months, weeks, and we've been having unrepented sin in our life. Oh, God, we want to repent and put on the new man in this moment and moving forward. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We look forward to everything that you're doing in the future, and we thank you for what you're doing right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you guys next week.